my name is Sandy Golding and I'm president of Beaches Watch. I want to thank you all for coming tonight. And I want to make sure everybody, did everybody get an agenda when you came in? Okay, good. If you didn't, there are some of these tables with the yellow tablecloth. Um, I'm going to run through some announcements really quick and then we'll move to our speakers for tonight. Um, first of all, I want to mention that we have contact information for our elected officials on the back of the agenda. So if you ever have any questions, comments, or concerns, this is how you're going to get in touch with your elected officials. Um, and speaking of that, I'd like to recognize we have one elected official with us tonight, uh, Maria Mark, who's with the Atlantic Beach City Commission. We want to thank you for being here. Okay. And um, let's see, just real quickly, to run through some of these announcements, uh, we do record these meetings, so if somebody was not able to be here, we will have them posted on YouTube and on the Beaches Watch website, so we hope you will encourage them to watch so that they can get the benefit of uh, the information that was shared by our speakers tonight. Um, also, we have, uh, we are trying to provide information about some of the more relevant topics right now. So Atlantic Beach, we've got a couple of topics. Um, Maria, do you want to say anything about the Atlantic Beach topics? Uh, yeah, just briefly. Uh, this is coming up on at our October 12th meeting, which is coming Monday. We've got two, two major, I say major items on the agenda. The first is um, the mayor and commission have uh, we've been talking about trying to strengthen buffers between our commercial and residential areas. Um, so we asked our community development board to look at that to make some recommendations and so they're bringing that before us um, on Monday for the, in the ordinance form as first reading. So this will be the first time actually we've had an opportunity to discuss what their recommendations are. But uh, they've had three um, recommendations to change the ordinance and the first was to prevent uh, what we call curb cuts or driveway cuts. Um, of um, rear, rear building entryways to the portion uh, that faces the residential areas. Um, the second is to require a more stringent lighting plan so that they're not, um, the residential areas are not, um, um, uh, they're not uh, impacted by, the, by commercial lighting. And then the third is to, for the parking lots, it's in the a tree, planted every 15 feet, we're now trying to say every 25 feet um, to help with the, the, the tree, to increase the tree canopy. Um, again, this will be at the first reading, so I'm sure there'll be a lot of discussion with the commission uh, in May of each week to come back for a second reading. Um, and then the second thing is we're, um, looks like we're moving forward the resolution to ban uh, statewide fracking. Um, this is one this has been discussed on a couple of occasions with the commission and we received we got consensus at the last meeting to move this forward. So it looks like this resolution will pass and we will be sending it to our respective um, representatives, uh, Tallahassee, hoping that we will join the other communities who have already passed this resolution um, to, to get the statewide meeting. Okay. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jacksonville Beach topics, um, the, the more prominent one is uh, Jacksonville Beach just had a workshop on Monday night about the downtown vision plan and um, you can go online to the website, to the city's website and see it, but there's a lot of things basically that Jacksonville Beach is trying to do to improve the downtown area of Jacksonville Beach as most of you know. There's not a diversity of businesses in the downtown area, there's a lot of bars and then there's a lot of restaurants that act like bars. And so the hope is that the city can do some things to try to diversify what's in the downtown area, improve parking. Um, so there's several things that um, they are going to be moving forward with. Some improvements to the Seawalk Pavilion, some uh, restrooms in some of the park areas, things like that. So there's cert certain things that they're going to be focusing on um, first and foremost. And parking is one of them. Uh, that seemed to be one of their bigger issues um, that they talked about Monday night. So you can go online and see the information about the downtown action plan. And uh, if they have another workshop, I highly encourage you guys to go to it because it's very, very informative. 
Um, Neptune Beach topics, do we have anybody that wants to speak to those? I don't think Rory is here tonight. Um, Neptune Beach is, oh, would you I like to? I just wanted to let you know that I think you see this morning the Ishban Communication Committee, we put up our first welcome to Neptune Beach sign where there was a no parking sign. Mm -hmm. It's right across from the church on First Street at Seagate. Uh -huh. And um, you'll start to see those popping up. So that's not part of the sign ordinance, but it is, it's just, it's another way to make it better. Okay. And the fair test is on Saturday. If anybody wants to volunteer at our beaches lunch table, we'd love to have you. Thank you very much. You, I, okay. I, perfect segue. Um, just one other thing, though, about Neptune Beach. Um, Neptune Beach did approve the budget with no increase in millage. Uh, and then the sign ordinance, they're still working on that. Apparently, there are several signs that are not in conformance with the new regulations for the sign ordinance. And so they're trying to figure out how to, how to get those signs into conformance without putting too much um, strain on the businesses that have those signs. Um, and as Andy said, Fairy Fest is this Saturday, and it's, uh, there's a treasure quest. Um, does anybody want to talk about that real quick? Curtis? Curtis. Do you want to come up here real quick and just mention something and tell people about it because it's new to Fairy Fest and it sounds interesting. It's a cheat sheet so we can win. <laughs> Thanks, Andy. So Fairy Fest, um, this is the fourth year for it, and uh, we all kind of jumped back in and thought of ways to expand it a little. And the expansion this year is, well, there's two things happening. One is uh, around noon, there's going to be a marker dedication, and that marker is for the Huguenot uh, basically massacre. It took place, you know, around the same period that the, the Spanish were you know, set on, setting up their colony, and the, the French were already up here, and some, some events took place. A, a hurricane actually changed the course of all our history, and uh, it's pretty amazing to, to learn about it. They're going to have workshop, well, some educational things. Uh, Lake Ray will be out there. He's going to speak about Fort Caroline and some new things they found where it's probably located. They're going to, uh, let's see, I think it's Lynn Conlon. Lynn is a historian. Corley, thank you. She's a historian and she's done a lot of work, research on the Huguenots. Real passionate about this, this day and this marker. Um, so I'd encourage you, maybe get to the festival early. Uh, there, the treasure quest, which um, Sandy's talking about. I've got this poster here. It's kind of an interesting uh, concept. What we wanted to do is get folks outside of the village. You know, when you go to Fairy Fest, you kind of hang out and you uh, have the events and it's it's a great time but you don't really get to experience what that area is all about and so we, we started this idea of planning it months ago getting permitting and getting it resolved it's it's like an adventure kind of deal you go over to uh, the park uh, Fort George Park and you uh, have a, a trail set up between Rebo Club and uh, the Kingsley Plantation. It's about a little mile trail, and we've set up 15 challenges. There, anyone can do it. These things are just kind of fun adventure challenges. If you want to just get off the couch and go out there and participate, it's early morning. If no one's heard about it, seen anything about it, I mean, you can literally show up at 6:30, 7 o'clock over on the. I know, I know, it's, it's a Saturday morning, <laughs> but if you show up. You can register and get you into this thing. JTA is actually shut shuttling us into the park. So we've got the trolleys moving us into the park, dropping us at Reball Club, and then five challenges right there. Real simple stuff, but very fun. I can't tell you what the challenges are because then it's cheating. You've got to kind of show up and be ready. Um, it's not huge exercise. It's just a discovery. You know, there's clue finding. And it's things that would get you into trouble. Things that would get you messy, a little bit messy. and. Um, It'll be done in about an hour and a half. There's a trivia contest that uh, is part of it. And then finally, there's a, a treasure hunt for the two teams that are the top two teams coming out of the Adventure Challenge and the Trivia Contest. So it should be a lot of fun. And if nothing else, just go to Fairy Fest and enjoy that and stick around for what they're going to be talking about. Because I think you'll learn a lot about how special the, this whole north, Northeast Florida, St. John's River, A1A, all this area has a lot of just treasurable things that I've, more and more people find out about, learn about, the better I think we all are. Thanks. Awesome. And I've got this stuff over at the table, that's okay. Okay. 
Yep, so be sure to pick up information at the table and then at the table where Eileen is sitting, we need, uh, Beaches Watch is going to have a booth at the event and we just need volunteers to help us at the booth hand out brochures, uh, talk to people, answer questions about Beaches Watch, what we're about. It's just an opportunity to, to get, get ourselves out there and help more people learn about what our organization is about. So we have some volunteer shifts. They're easy, but it's an opportunity to, to be a part of the event. And uh, the shifts are on the table where Eileen is. So if anybody could sign up for a shift, that'd be great. And then we've got a couple of other things. It, um, for those of you who may not know, we do a give back donation every year in December. And that's a donation we give to a Beaches nonprofit. And we recognize a nonprofit that is doing something to enrich the lives of Beaches citizens. So we are asking for nominations now, and uh, you can submit those. There's information on here about how to submit nominations for the nonprofit. But basically, we want to know why you think the, non the, the nonprofit is deserving of the give back donation, what they do to help the Beaches citizens. So. Um, the email address is here where you can, it's info at beacheswatch.com to send the, uh, the nomination to. And then also in December we are going to be doing um, elections for uh, some board, board of directors positions. And so if anyone is interested in potentially serving on the Beaches Watch board, we would love to know about your interest and please email us. Uh, it's a two year term and um, it's once a month that the board meets. And, uh, we are always looking for fresh faces and new ideas. And then um, October, we always kick off early bird renewal for the memberships. So if you renew your membership in October, it's good for uh, the rest of the year through 2016. And memberships are $10 for individuals and 15 for families. And that just helps support some of the things that we're doing throughout the year. And then November 4th will be our next meeting. Um, we don't have the speaker finalized yet, but we will send out an email to our email list when we do have that finalized. But we hope you'll join us for that meeting. And um, any other announcements real quick that anyone has? Then I'd like to introduce our speakers for tonight. We have Myra Martello, who is the Director of Community Mobilization with Jacksonville Public Education Fund. And she's going to talk to us about the changes to the Florida uh, Schools Accountability System. Oh, okay. Don't know what that was, but anyway. And then we also have Scott Shine, who's our District 2 School Board representative. And uh, they will both be able to give you some information about what we should expect with the changes. And then also, Myra brought some handouts, and uh, those are also on the table where Eileen is sitting, and so we hope you'll take these handouts, but because they have some information that you'll want to take with you. So, Myra, I'll hand the what? floor over to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much for extending the invitation. I'm just going to really, out of respect, I'm just going to introduce the topic and maybe we do this as a conversation. But I would like to start just by asking a question. How many of you are familiar with the change in the standards, the Florida standards, and the assessment? I, I see several students, and I know some of you are teachers, but how many of you? So what are you hearing about the new assessment? What is the experience from the students or from parents? Whoever wants to jump in. Don't be shy. What was that? <laughs> Put it here. Uh, from what I understand, they're not real sure. The new standard, the FSA, is different from the FCAT. Yes. And being a teacher, um, our issue as teachers is we never know how they're going to grade our school because they change the formula and the calculation like FWC changes regulations. So that's my issue. So that is the issue and that's why we're hosting a community meeting where we're going to have the superintendent and parents and students talking. But basically what happened is 
In Florida, we started the implementation of what is called the Common Core Standards that later were changed, but the, the implementation started in 2010. The last year, in 2014, they started the implementation of the Florida new standards. And therefore, they changed the assessment. So there is no EPCA 2.0 anymore, even though I can bet anybody there's still many parents don't even know that this, the test changed. And what happens is these new standards, the Florida Standards Assessment, or it's just really based in higher order thinking. So the goal of the standards is to really increase college readiness for our students to really be able to have the jobs that we're going to need in the future, more critical thinking. But the issue is the transition time. So of course the implementation hasn't been so simple. It, the best way of understanding what is happening is it's like when you're remodeling a house. I'm sure many of you have had that experience, right? So you have boxes in, boxes in the middle, there is a lot of dust. So it's a short thing for a longer term gain, or at least that is the expectation. The issue is that the Department of Education, the State Department of Education, has changed the formula of how school grades get, get calculated. That formula has changed many times. The challenge is usually part of one of the ingredients of the uh, school grades formula is to have the growth, a measure of growth. So in order for you to know how much a student has gained in knowledge, you need to have the same assessment. But you cannot compare the Florida 2.0 results with FSA because they're measuring different things. So there is not an apple to apple comparison. The Jacksonville Public Education Fund, as well as many community leaders and even the superintendents, push a lot the State Board of Education to really put a pause in the issuing of the school grades. But that unfortunately didn't happen. So the challenge is there, even though they, the new formula, at least from what has been released, is not going to include growth, it's still going to be an issue. So the challenge is right now, to give you an example, Duval County has 22 schools that are F, and I think 42 that are D. The projections, because nobody knows the cut scores yet, the State Board of Education and the commissioners just made a recommendation, so it's going to be a one to five scale, the same scale for the FCAT. But we don't know the passing, the current scores. What is it going to be proficient? The challenge is, if many of you have been, maybe you have been your teachers, so I'm sure you're moving some of your students in grade level, right? But that, that movement is not going to count because it's only going to count who is passing. So that is the issue at hand. And there is a lot of controversy. You know, we are encouraging people, we're going to have this meeting, but we're encouraging you to really contact your elected officials. There's still some window of opportunity. I'll let Scott shine. Speak about that. Not them, because this is not controlled by the local school board. It's Tallahassee. So we need to really contact our elected officials in Tallahassee to really put a pressure and say, this is not fair. It's not fair with the students. It's not fair with the teachers because we know, you know, the training from the teachers, we're not there yet. So the challenge as a community is when these school grades get released, that by the way, the expectation usually is around December. Now they're talking about January or maybe February. So we don't know when they're going to be released and what are the implications. They're saying this year is not going to, there's not going to be a punishment, but it's going to be really complicated for the community to understand that even though the school grades are going to look bad, that we're moving into the right direction because there are other indicators. So that is the challenge that we're facing. I'm going to let <coughs> jump in there and we can sure. just have a conversation. Well, you didn't leave a lot of meat on the bone, but I'll see I will, of course. There's still things there. <laughs> there, there. Um, it's great to be here with Dr. Marcello from yeah. uh, Jacksonville Public Education Fund, and of course, the folks from Beach and Watch. In fact, uh, it's great to have this resource with the Public Education Fund here in Jacksonville. If you really want to learn about what goes on in our schools, you go to their website. I use it all the time. And I say that because one of the problems I see in education in the state of Florida and in our own system is we do not have a core competency in analytics. Uh, from my point of view, I came from the corporate side, from the business side. Early in my career, I work with statistics and analytics, and I, I'm really, I, I have to say I'm actually shocked that in an academic environment, our understanding of numbers and statistics 
is remedial uh, within our own system and even to some extent uh, within the state. And we'll get more into that in a moment. But one of the problems is we're talking about a measurement program. And if you don't have a core competency in measurements and analytics, um, how can you effectively do what you're trying to do? So to go back and have a little bit of a level set about how we got here, um, about, about a, over a decade ago, almost 20 years now, I guess, we started out with something called No Child Left Behind, which was a national program that said, Everybody has to test their kids. And there's good and bad in this thing. It's not all, a lot of people, we hear a lot of the bad part of testing. There's also a lot of good in this. So the, the truth and the reality of this thing is somewhere in the middle. And the good in that, there are a lot of school systems, uh, rural school, school systems, inner city school systems, that were really, we used to use the term, pushing kids along. They were graduating, they heard the stories, 10, 20 years ago about kids who get out of high school and they couldn't even read. You know, today that's changed to a great extent, I hope, um, because we do have a more uniform system of measuring what happens in the classroom environment. That's changed recently with the concept of common core. And of course, the key part of that is common. Everybody does the same thing. Huge advantages with that in that a child, say, comes from Northern Virginia, in the military to Florida, to Mayport, uh, they can leave in the middle of the session and they come into the third, fourth, fifth grade and they are basically where they should be. Is that's how it would operate uh, in theory. Um, some of the problems with that, specifically in Florida, is that Common Core isn't actually common. It's based on something called the AIR standard. And there are about three states that are using that standard as opposed to about 40 states that are using the, the Common Core, and then there's a couple who are doing nothing or whatever. Um, so that's that's a problem, and what concerns me as a school board member, and what I think even the community should be uh, concerned about, is that I believe within three to five years, we're gonna come back and say, why are we doing something different? Why aren't we doing exactly what everyone else is doing so we can compare our scores nationally fairly. Remember that whole thing about analytics? You, you just don't do it this way. You don't have a different system if you really do want to be common. So I think that we'll look at another change uh, and probably adopt basically what's going on in the rest of the nation in a couple years. And that means another change for educators and students. I know they don't want to hear that. I heard a statistic uh, the other day it said in the past seven years we've changed our standards for school assessment in some way, either in a small way or a large way, 36 times in seven years. And we have, we have to be driving our teachers crazy with this. I know that we are because they, they tell us that. Um, so those are, are some of the things that, that we're dealing with in this. We talked about the concept of the cut score. What does that mean? That's basically where we set the, the notion of what is pass-fail or what is an A, B, C, et cetera. And a lot of you folks in education know about the different methodologies for determining things like a reading level. I think it's called the Flesh-lish scale. Uh, you can actually do this on Microsoft Word. You can go and say, what's your reading level? In fact, I tried Dr. Beatty's, one of his letters to teachers, one he just sent out. It's actually a 30, and that's the same level as the Harvard Law Review. So that's why no one understands what he's saying. It's, <laughs> that's the way up there. Um, how we're setting this and how the proposal from the Department of Education uh, is been laid out right now is these numbers are somewhat arbitrary. In fact, they are arbitrary because what they would do is they take our existing environment, as, as uh, uh, Dr. Marcello mentioned before, and put more kids, teachers, schools into the lower ratings. And the concept, one of the the rationales behind this is that, well, we need to push them. Um, is that a good thing? I looked at the statewide data. Um, typically, the numbers are, are pretty volatile um, at the schools. Uh, there might be as, as, as few as uh, 20 or 30 in the past five to 10 years, as high as 50 or 60. That number, with the current proposed numbers that, that we've got, this is all very preliminary, may look something like 200 S schools. So across the board, we may be looking at a 
four-fold increase in F schools. And the last point I'll make on, on this is that this concerns me because we have a governor who was just elected who said, well, I'm a pro-business governor. I want people to come to Florida and open a business. Well, what does that say? When again, this is common, so the numbers are the same. Performance hasn't changed in all likelihood. A lot of teachers are doing better. But we're going to say what was a D is now an F. What was an A is now a C. And these real estate sites and other sites and other organizations, they pick this up and they just simply say, oh, you're a C? Oh. And that goes on the website and people moving here and looking at data say, oh, that's a, that's a C. How does that help promote the state from a business perspective, a place to relocate? How does that give students credit for the hard work they're doing? How does that give teachers the reward and incentive to produce more and do more? And we talked about BAM, uh, which is a very complicated model, statistical model. In fact, we have a, a hero here that discovered and her, her data, teacher says, this data can't be right. I looked at it in a meeting here uh, several months ago. And, and again, I have a statistics background. Like, how, how do you get to these numbers? You don't. And we had some folks look into it, and sure enough, it looked like the data was flawed. But what's going to happen is we don't have that, that's largely based on growth in academic performance. So since we're losing our baseline here, we lose that growth component. Who that really hurts uh, are large urban school districts where scores are already low for other reasons other than the hard work of teachers and, and, and parents and students. But we lose this idea of the gains, and that's really what we've been focused on because now we have this new baseline. And the Board of Education feels that we really don't need to have a year where we're going to hold harmless like other, other states are doing, not apply these grades. We're going to do it now. Now, from a, a statistician standpoint, could it be done? Yeah. I, could, I bet you I could do it. Would I trust the state to do it and do it the way they're doing? What I've heard tonight, what we're seeing in the data, absolutely not. But I, my hope is that as this evolves, and groups like JPEF, our organization, our superintendent, we've all come out and said, don't do this. This is wrong. Let's listen to reason. But in Tallahassee, they're in a different environment, a different mindset, and uh, a different accountability, and that's and that's the problem. And there, and there's philosophies that push two sides of this. We call that politics, and that's what happens is politicians on the different sides push, and the students and the teachers and the schools and the parents all get squeezed. But also, there's a lot of confusion. Part of my job is really going out and talking to to people in general. So I'm sure you all have seen in Facebook all the you know. The the examples of math comfort. Yes, it is different. I mean, it's definitely different, but that's what we want. I mean, I had the opportunity, I am from Colombia, and I had the opportunity to go two years ago to a public hearing in Tallahassee. And I was just in shock that there were people like giving you know, testimony saying, I don't want my kid to think critically. I was just like, you have to be kidding me. This is not possible. I mean, seriously, there's not a a way for me to understand that there are people who don't want that. So of course that requires more time from parents and there are some resources. So of course the school district has Parent Academy and they have several classes for you to better understand. But the main advice that we're giving is get in touch to your child's teacher. Or if you're volunteering, really get to the school and just try to find ways to really help and support our teachers and our students. The challenge is how do you how are we going to explain that you know our graduation rate has increased in more than 16 percent in the last five years? When you are receiving and in the media you see oh Duval County is among the lowest performers. Of course, it that is going to be contradictory because it's like the other metaphor that we're trying to use is like let's say that you're driving your car right and your speedometer is in kilometers and out of the blue it's going to change to miles. So of course it's going to look like it's going to be a huge drop, but it, what is that really measuring? So how can be how can we better support our children, our teachers to really adjust to this change? That yes, now is difficult, but in the long run it's going to be we are all going to be better off. The other issue that we constantly hear is the comparison with St. John's County. 
we can, that's the same thing of trying to compare EPCAT with FSA. There is a totally different population. St. John's County is a smaller county. They don't have so many urban students. They don't have the poverty rates that we have in New York County. So it is a different challenge. So of course, part of what we hear people is like, we are not saying, at least from JPE, we're not making excuses. We're just saying, we just need to give it time. We, our like, you know, college readiness has improved. We are 80%. Are we there yet? Yes, no, we're 80% in reading and 60% in math. Is that ideal? No, but we're making progress. So the challenge and the message for you is how can we connect to the schools so we can really help people to understand this is what is happening because if people, the only thing they see is in the headline in the media, you know, global county is performing. And that doesn't really tell the full story. So our position is school grades are important, accountability is important, but we have to put a pressure in our legislators to be serious about not making these constant changes in the formula because then it's it just really fictitious. Like, oh, we're saying now passing is here at this level, but next year we're gonna increase it. So of course, it's just really, you're not even to even measure as a teacher how much progress your students are are really making because the constant changes that have been implemented. For like three years, maybe four, we're on that system and everybody's pretty happy, especially at the beach, because all the beach schools were A's. So why did they why are they making a change? Why do they have to change that system. The FSA says, yeah, why do they have to change it? Why did why does the formula have to be changed? So you're talking about the formula and not about this. Yeah, thing. I mean let's I mean I'm gonna make some the back eight hundred. Right? Those are the guys that you gotta get through and you gotta try to get them to class and remediate the PD and remediate the math. And you know I'm I mean i at Fletcher we got Joe Reynolds works his rear end off to go find those kids and get them in school. And so we get that back 800 number up and all of a sudden we're there. Because our top 500, excuse me, 500 are there. I mean, our top 500 are there. 96% graduation, everything's cool. But for all these years we had this formula and they teach us how to get that back 500 up. That means you go out and for y'all that aren't he would go out in the neighborhood, knock on the door, and say, why aren't you in school? And we would get that kid in school. Now, now we worked hard at that. And so we get that back 500 number up, and now they want to change the formula. That, to me, that's not logical. So my question is, there's got to be more than this. Why are they changing the formula? Why did they teach us how to do the back 500 and now come in and go, we're changing this? I, I asked that question to the superintendent. Um, what purpose does it serve? And the answer I got, and, and he doesn't really know, a lot of people don't have their information at this point, but uh, what he told me and what he believes, and he worked there, he's worked with the, the commissioner, that there's a general belief that if we set these marks higher, it will it'll stimulate more learning. Now, do, do I agree with that? Um, in fact, I, I have a problem with many of the different dimensions of how we set cut scores, how we determine what grade level is, especially when it becomes arbitrary. In fact, one example of this is what we currently have, and there's, there's controversy around this, the ABCD ratings, because the, the band, I learned this from the JPAP report, that the A rating is pretty fat, and then the, the Bs and Cs, except you get skinny. Well, and then there's even people that say, well, that, we, and, cause we get, once we get people to cross the B into the A, then that growth soft. What if we took that B and those others and expanded it so there were more people in there? You know, I think one of the things all of this does, again, to the testing, uh, programs, common core is what we have today. Philosophically, I think are good, but we we've, we've gotten to, and, and the public pushes this. The public 
wants to see results and they want to measure results. And there's this a lot of attitudes out in the public. Like they'll say, well, Dingwall County is a bad school system, good, bad school. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean the teachers aren't working hard? That somehow if you go to that school, you're not going to be educated? Or does it mean that some schools have a challenge where these kids are coming out of an economically disadvantaged area? So it's much harder to teach those children. Now, and, and I'll say this, if you, because you talk about St. John's, you talk about Nassau County. Nassau County is about the size of school board district too, the district that you live and work in. I looked at the iReady Achieve 3000 data. We had these preliminary data, it's kind of our, our radar as to where we're going, the data just came in. So if you took just this region, I love to say it, Ocean County, and you said, okay, how does Ocean County compare against the seven largest school districts in the state of Florida? It's number one. It's the best. It's one of the top districts, counties, Ocean County, in the state. But if you look at Duval County, we're at the bottom, we're at number seven. And one of the reasons that happens is that you look at the poverty in Duval County. Zip codes 06 and 09, not to the lowest uh, income producing counties in the state of Florida, to the lowest in the United States of America. I think we lose sight of how challenged we are uh, economically in some parts of this county. Uh, especially when we live, we have the, the privilege and the, and the fortune to live in this incredible uh, part of the city that, that we live in. So those are some of the things, that, and, and, and uh, Dr. Marcello re referred to this earlier, it's a lot of this is what you count. So this whole thing of why has gotten into, I believe, a, a big misunderstanding about how to effectively use measurement tools and statistics. Because when I was in the corporate environment, we would never use statistics the way the school system is, because we lose money. It, it would lead us, the compass deal would point us in the wrong direction, and we'd make a lot of mistakes. So there's there's good in this thing, and there's there's bad, and we need to get back to the kind of things that JPEG is doing, which is real, rational, statistical work uh, that makes sense and is done within the boundaries of what uh, statisticians and researchers uh, have, have, have done for years. But trying to answer your question, I think that's where the opportunity for civic engagement is so important. And taking the time to explain to people. Because I go to people and you know we're losing a lot of students to charter schools. Because many people think, oh, I just need to get my kid out of public school. Well, let me have bad news for you. Charter schools are public schools. So they also have to take the test. They might have differences and it might not be as same amount of tests that public school have, but they're subject to the same thing. But people don't know. And especially when you are in the urban curve, like people's like, this school is failing again. I need to find a better choice if I can. But the other thing that I also like, there's even the schools in this district that I can guarantee you, you have an ELL, that student is in a different picture, even being in an A school, because their background is different, English is their second language, their socioeconomics is different. So even within the A schools, there's so much diversity that I don't think we realize there is here. So what I will encourage you to do is ask, those are the questions that we need to ask, but you have to ask them to Tallahassee. Because where, is, where are the reasons? There are many conspiracy theories there. <laughs> and that's not where the place where we stay. We try to be the voice of reason. Like this is what research is showing us. So we did a policy brief about that, and we did all a huge campaign trying to really put a pressure in legislators to really stop the issue of school grades because it makes no sense. This is not new. And now you see in the media every day and different superintendents and PTA and different organizations are trying to really push the legislators to try to really change this situation because it's, it, I don't know if you saw in the media, Quartile. I mean, we're having a hard time trying to explain to people what is the quartile and how can you really compare what is this data really telling you, which is not much. It's not much because you cannot compare apples to apples. I came here from Miami a year ago, but 20 years ago, I was sitting in a room like this listening about FCAT. <laughs> and my whole thing was to get rid of the FCAT. Well, they got rid of the FCAT, but you're just putting in a new test with other dot data and the problem that I see statistically is that you bad data in, bad data out. If you have teachers telling you you can't report certain incidences because we have 
there's so many incidences reported, we're not we're gonna get a worse grade. So you know it, it wasn't just the um, the, the school's kids' scores. It had to do with um, their behavior, um, what else was going on in the school, and and people were lying. I mean, I, I'm talking Miami. I'm not talking here. I don't know what's going on. My kids are grown now. My grandchildren are out of state. We could tell how our kids were doing when I was in school because we took the what was it? The Stanford achievement? What was the test? CTES. It was a test, and it was given to everybody in the whole country. You got an 80, so you figured you're okay, you're doing okay. You could see kids coming into Miami a lot from different places and different levels and different schools. My area where I live was very similar to the beaches. We were all A and B schools, pretty much. The high schools sometimes were C's because sometimes they reported the things they could have gotten away with but didn't. But, but the other part of it, I saw by sitting on the committee at the school was when they became an A school, the teachers got like a thousand dollars a piece. Absolutely. And I think you take that money out of it, and, and I used to say we need to either give the students some of that money, <laughs> you know, they get a little card that they can go to McDonald's and get a sandwich or something healthy. <laughs> Um, but, but see, so there's lots of different angles to this, not just statistics, not just the kid going to school, but I think we demoralized the teachers in the last 20 years by having the FCAT. Getting rid of the FCAT, you're just bringing in more, count, more crazy. Well, let me add to her. First of all, everybody wants to be an A. And we took a lot of pride in that for a long time. And I mean, we would promote it. We, we pushed the kids to it. Matter of fact, I think 2010, 2011, we had the, we told those freshman class that you guys were going to keep us on that level. And when they got there, we had a big party because they did. It worked. The grade system on that formula was working. We went from 88% graduation rate in like four years we reached 96. Now, you, I've said this before publicly. You tell me I'm going to score 96, I'll take that. I'll take that every year. The problem is you've got to make a game to maintain your rank. And when you're at the top. Right? How do you go higher? Now, I'm going to be devil's advocate because she brought it up. I, go, I think they made the change because when we did achieve an A or you did achieve a letter grade higher, the teachers did get merit pay. We got an extra boost. And I think they can't fund that. I think we had so much success. Now, I could be wrong. I know in Duval, schools went up. How many A, a high schools did we have? I think four or five. I tell you how many A's in school. Yeah. And out here, every point in this Peter pattern has Atlantic Coast and Wood. It has always been an A for all A's. Yeah, so my point is when you're an A, we get. And I really believe those guys are, hey, I'm a child of the 60s. Everything's a conspiracy. <laughs> Everything's a conspiracy. Don't. So I believe those guys got the room and they go, we can't afford this. We can't afford this. These guys have figured out, and I'm going to throw that out, the back 500. At Fletcher, we had to find 12 kids. We had to keep them in school, and we did. And we found the teachers, me being one, with standard science class. And I, I did extra for that. When I say extra, spend extra time with him to get him, get him going. And when you do that with that kind of kid, all you got to do is show him a little love. When you show him a little love, then they give you love back. And then, so we got those 12 kids and we are, we went to an A. And it wasn't because of my kids. It wasn't because of the accelerator. They're there. Those guys, those guys put us on the map. It was the back 12, 12, 12 out of 2,300 that put us over that A level because we got them higher reading scores, we got them higher math scores, and they were potentially going to graduate. So all you got to do is find 12. And if you learn how to do that back 500, you can be an A every year. And if somebody, it leaked, Robert Young, you all know Dr. Robert Young? Robert figured it out about six years ago. 
And he was at Revolt, and he took Revolt from a D to an A in one year. D to an A, because he figured out the back 500. And it probably wasn't 12 kids, it was probably 30. So I don't think they can fund it, and that's why they made the change. That's my opinion. All right, so I have a couple of comments. Um, one is a kind of a segue into what you were saying. I, the biggest problem I see is that it's the kids that are in the middle that get caught lost in the cracks. You know, if you've got your kids who are under underperforming, then Zoom. There's all kinds of resources, there's all kinds of uh, programs and attention paid to them. If you got your kids who are in advanced classes or in the ACE program or the IB program, boom, they're already set. People know they're already on the track to success. But you've got these kids that are in the middle, and my son is one of them. He's 16 years old, he's at Fletcher High School, he's a junior. And he's been one of them. He's in the middle. He's a you know C performer, B performer, could be an A, maybe an ace, but this is where he is. So I see that all the resources are going either to the really underserved kids or the kids that are outperforming everybody else. Fine. My my question is, um, why aren't the subs when you have subs in classrooms? Why aren't they prepared to teach a lesson? As soon as my son walks in a class and he sees it's a sub, he's out. Because he says, Mom, all we do is sit there. We don't do anything. And the last month of school, after all the testing and everything's done, do you know what they do? Nothing. They do absolutely nothing in class. They do no review. They do no prep. I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to butt in. <laughs> that is not true. You know, I'm, I don't, think, don't even think that you're going to sit in my classroom and do nothing. <laughs> well, I'm going to go my son to sit in the next week. I'm going to go with my son to for the last three years of being at the last uh, two years of being at Fletcher. And and that's that's long 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 up with the they're watching, they're watching, they're watching movies, they're watching Disney stuff, they're not even watching educational things. There's, there's a couple so, points there. So my that. question is, yeah. if that's what they're doing in the last two or three weeks of school, then why not just end the session early? Or, so even flip, or maybe even flip the school year, so they're actually going to school in the summer when there are no waves, and then they can have winter off when there are waves. I mean, uh, honestly. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so. um, it, it's interesting you mentioned a couple of that. My son has said exactly the same thing. And uh, th there are some issues around this in the year and everything is so focused on the test. You get to that point. Um, I, I think though something that you said, I think that it's, it's really mission critical for what we have here are the kids in the middle. And there's a couple different groups there. One of the most Frequent calls I get, I got this especially at uh, uh, the end of last year, kids with minor learning disabilities like dyslexia, ADHD, how we handle those kids. Um, and we really don't, and, and until BD came here, we didn't really have a lot of programs. In fact, we even had confirmed federal complaints under ADA that we were violating federal law. And, uh, and for what I've seen in my investigations, that's an area that we are deficient. Not that we don't do that, and compared to some of the alternatives out there, the charter school will tell you, yes, we have to take those kids, but you're really better off going through, and, and the people who have this issue, they know the county is where that core competency lies. I actually fought this battle last night over redistricting uh, schools in the urban core, because we're spending a lot of money there. We have three high schools with average capacity of about 50%. And I wanted to push them to, to do the redistricting process to start that and accelerate it. We've been, they talk about we need more and more time. And my point is, yes, and this is the future. Because we've been on this, talking about this for a decade. And so that type of thing consumes a lot of resources. And I got beat severely over this last night. I'm still recovering. But we won that one. Um, so that is an issue, and you are right. My predecessor, uh, Fell Lee, and many of you know Fell, uh, was a great guy, and he used to talk about that phenomenon. And I used to listen to him, and I think, yeah, okay, yeah, right. But I've gotten in there, and I see this abundance of money that we spend in those two groups, and it's good to help kids. We're all about helping kids, but there is this middle, and that's, that is an area where we need to look, and again, this whole issue of analytics, because we only have a certain amount of money, and I hate to put it into clinical terms, but we're, we're going to take money and put it somewhere. We can't put it everywhere. We don't have unlimited funds. I think we're, is it 46 out of 50, or 47 out of 50 in terms of our student funding in Florida? It's very, very low. Um, 
um, where can we get uh, a good return? And are we, and these are questions, both of these sentences are questions, um, are we underserving 